Hi everyone, uh, I'm Subhashni and uh, today I'm here to talk about uh, creating analytic storyboards. Um, I have been asked, uh, asked a couple of times about how to efficiently um, you know, um, showcase an analytics or data science project to stakeholders. Uh, a lot of them could be uh, senior business managers, some of them could be non-technical people. Uh, and um, you know, I'm here today to talk about uh, a process that I use. Um, I come from a company called Pexitix, People Excellence Indicator Analytics. And I will showcase to you uh, a project uh, that, um, you know, as a sample, as a case study uh, on how I have used uh, a storyboard approach to uh, showcase the project. Um, before we go forward, uh, let me uh, talk to you about uh, this slide. How do you think it looks? Too brief? Yes, it's a simple uh, topic and it is definitely very interesting, but perhaps it's just a bit too brief for us to fit an analytics project into uh, this frame. Okay. Uh, now, what is your thought when you look at war and peace? Too long? Yes? It's a complex story and it takes time uh, to understand this story. Uh, and definitely, uh, you know, if we are going to make long winded presentations, however interesting it is to perhaps another analytics person, uh, it is not something which is interesting to a non analytics uh, person and they start losing interest. So what is a good way to go? Uh, I uh, personally find So here in front, um, so here in uh, on the screen, you will see what is called the Aristotle's incline. Uh, in a nutshell, this incline shows uh, um, a story's movement upwards, where there's an increase in dramatic tension from the opening to the climax. Okay, and then it uh, drops back towards the normalcy like it was during the openings you know you see he was sigh of relief that yes um, what has to happen has happened okay uh, so what are the points that are said uh, so at the first 25 percent of the time okay that is the first 15 minutes in an hour you would end up on the opening uh, context of what is and then uh, you move to the plot one where some incident will happen then there's the act two, which is the longest act, which will also include the midpoint. So that will take 50% of the time, which is in one hour, it will take uh, 30 minutes. Okay, so the first 15 minutes is act one, where you come to know the background. The next 30 minutes is act two, uh, where you come to uh, understand the, um, you know, the details uh, of the story. And in the middle of this also, you have the interval where there'll be a big reveal, right? Uh, something big comes to your notice. Uh, and then the last 25% of the time, that is 15 minutes in an hour, would go to the climax where there's the final conflict. At this point of final conflict, everything is resolved or everything fails, depending on where the story is headed. And at the end, last few minutes, you have the wrap up where the normalcy is restored okay uh, so this is the type of breakup that uh, we should try to show even for our stories and you will notice therefore what is coming out is this breakup of the storyline into smaller steps smaller steps for the audience to understand what is happening uh, but it should it should be leading to the conclusion right and now I follow this particular six point uh, or six step process called Decova and I, uh, which starts from defining the business problem, uh, understanding the data involved, which is collecting the data, organizing it, uh, dealing with cleaning issues of the data. Uh, then comes the statistics and the programming part of uh, the project where we would have done our visualizations, graphs, charts, 
and then we would also have done our statistical analysis model building and finally at the end of this we when we have these multiple possibilities these models we have to come to a solution which is that solution it will be the one which best will resolve the business problem right so this is the process this six step process of dikova and i which i have also uh, put in my book um, you know this is what i also uh, put into the slides i have found it to be a great way to uh, you know sort of go forward uh, when you look at defining the business problem uh, uh, it's not a one line definition because invariably you will have to set the context which is what was the business problem and how does it translate to an analytics uh, problem uh, then you have collecting the data and at this stage uh, you know uh, the uh, type of data that was available um, you know did you have to create samples did you consider cohorts then you comes the stage of organizing the data uh, where you had looked at missing values data quality outliers dummy variables combining different types of data together then is the visualization part where after all the clean up what was that chunk of data on which you ran the model okay which was the y variable or problem statement how did it interact with other variables and post that you have the phase of the ana analyze or building your statistical models where different statistical um, principles were taken into account maybe a multitude of models were considered and built finally there is the insights where uh, the best way possible um, was uh, is recommended to the business and uh, why it is recommended what is the outcome that can be expected with using this way is put together so d is the act 1 c o and v a this middle part forms 50% of your project maybe more than that sometimes 60% 70% of your project uh, that part of it is uh, the middle act okay and then finally your insights the comparison of the models and the final insights or recommendations this is the act 3 okay uh, so if i was to explain this uh, short case study to you Uh, we have a website which is called pexitest.com this is a talent assessment and surveys platform and uh, we wanted to build a yardstick which would help our customers uh, especially hr professionals to interpret the numbers that come into the talent assessment in a realistic manner uh, because we had been getting this feedback that uh, you know how how to take a call so it's great to know that somebody uh, is at a 50% or a 60% in logical reasoning but what does that mean right uh, is that good or bad so we thought what we do is uh, we'd create a yardstick and this yardstick would be useful for letting the hr professionals or the managers of teams understand that um, you know the talent scores that came for hiring purposes for high potential identification so uh, within the employees the learning needs identification within the employees and even prioritizing of the learning needs you know the couple of learning needs which were very urgent for the employee and leadership deployment which is basically uh, every leader you know would do well in certain roles so somebody who is a great ceo may not make a great cfo right so the fitment of leadership identification of coaching needs etc was uh, these were the uh, four aspects we thought the yardstick could help our customers make a better uh, judgment Uh, so uh, when you uh, take uh, this and put it into an analytics uh, problem statement language uh, what this would mean is we wanted to create a peer benchmark algorithm now the thing with the peer benchmark that we wanted was that it should be a statistical benchmark but it should also be easy to interpret okay with descriptive statistics and once the model is built this should be an automated process where the machine could learn and uh, could continue to update the outcomes and therefore um, these outcomes could continue to flash for the 
HR managers. Given this background, we move into the middle act, which is how was the data collected, where was it housed, and um, uh, you know what did we have to do to get a sense of the data. So the sources of data were easy. Ours is a uh, structured database at the back end, and um, it was easy for us to take out the data. Uh, the sampling, or when we looked at the cohorts that we had to consider, there were two different types of categories of attributes. Uh, so there are some attributes or questions which have right and wrong answers, like for maths. You cannot have a, uh, a you know ambiguous answer in maths. But for there is another psychological category of questions where there are no right or wrong answers, right? So uh, the scoring had to be worked out differently for both of these. The benchmark scores had to be set separately for both of these. So when you look at these uh, samples, we knew for a fact that there would be multiple models to be created. And we also knew that there would be certain exclusions in the data because there were a lot of testing and demo profiles on any website, right? You, you know, people come, they look at it, they do half the things and they leave, right? Uh, so then came the next phase, which is organizing the data. And here you uh, would, uh, we had to do a fair amount of understanding of missing values and how to deal with it. Because especially, you know, when people take an assessment, they skip through some of the questions. There were outliers. Often, you know, people, some questions showed that people had spent a long period of time on them. And when we looked it backwards and tried to understand the reason, it seemed to have been errors in the website functioning somebody getting logged off in the middle because the internet was not good, et cetera. There was a creation of dummy variables, uh, yes, no variables, derived variables, uh, which were calculated variables like the scores themselves. And uh, there was a lot of combining of databases because there were different, I mean, like who was a peer? I mean, what would be defined as a peer? And uh, we realized that perhaps the best definition of a peer would include education, age, and the country, because different people seem to have uh, different uh, levels and attributes uh, for different countries. So yes, we have worked as PEXI test, uh, uh, you know, outside India, especially in Africa, and this is something we have noticed. Um, the uh, data was quite huge. So there were uh, approximately 60, um, uh, you know, uh, lack questions had been uh, attempted across 32 categories by multitude of candidates. Uh, yes, we've been in existence since 2017, so we had all the data. Um, so then came the question, what would be a good visualization of this data? So uh, for each of the 32 categories of questions, we found that uh, looking at a normal distribution, and an understanding of how the questions uh, and scores were, um, uh, you know, panning out made a lot of sense. Uh, this um, uh, took some time, and uh, you know, an interpretation. Uh, but what came out of it was uh, uh, that um, you know, uh, a very good understanding for each category of questions. Um, and uh, then when we looked at the analytics. Uh, you know, we, as I said, one of the things we wanted to do was to have the models to be considered as very explainable. And we realized that central tendency or descriptive statistic models would be things which would, uh, which people found easy to um, uh, understand. Now you would uh, see uh, in this graph itself that, you know, in symmetrical distributions, the mode is equal to the median is equal to the mean. While for asymmetrical distributions, uh, these three parameters do not lie. So if it is an asymmetrical distribution, we would want to go with the median, which is your 50th percentile. But uh, if it is a symmetrical distribution, we would want to go with the, uh, with the mean, which is an easier to understand uh, uh, factor. Uh, but uh, also that, uh, you know, the mean and the median are nearly the same in a, um, a symmetrical distribution. So if we went, uh, we had done the visualizations and we had realized that all the distributions for the categories were symmetrical and we decided to go ahead. Uh, we also did uh, the calculation for both median and mean and decided to go ahead with the mean calculations. So um, uh, 
you know uh, that there were a few things of course the visualization helped and also that the count of cases uh, in each of the categories was easily above 100 okay so uh, it made sense for us to look at mean uh, for the benchmarks the peer benchmarks and uh, what we therefore did is that we created a peer benchmark score which uh, has been integrated into the site and currently comes along in every report uh, and what this does is it shows the team uh, like here in the screen you can see it shows the candidates uh, score and it shows the benchmark score adjacent to each other and it gives a very easy yardstick for the uh, hr person and the team manager to take a call that is this person needing some help in certain areas is this person performing much before or rather much higher than the average in certain areas so it took into account hiring uh, high potential identification learning needs identification and leadership deployment uh, we have different uh, we have different types of reports so you know you have cognitive ability leadership um, competencies at three levels uh, you have skill assessment, so not only for data science, sales, uh, finance. Um, so all these types of assessments uh, uh, led to multiple categories. And the thing is, we are adding into the categories, right? We are adding assessments on a real-time basis. So when you looked in a summary of the project, um, the outcome was very um, uh, was very well liked. And the software that we used for the project, uh, there was MySQL for the data, Python for analytics, and .NET for production deployment of the solution proposed. Uh, the cloud platform was Microsoft Azure. The scoring models, we know that there were two types depending on the attribute types uh, or question types. Uh, the peer benchmarking variables uh, we used were age, country, qualification, and the attributes of the questions. So a combination and permutation of all of this right, uh, has been used. Models for statistical comparison, we had used two, which was the mean and the median. And we realized that both of them give very similar results. And we decided to go with mean, which is uh, an average and easily interpretable. The process for continuous updates, which has been incorporated in the system. The first thing is the cleaning out of junk data, which means outliers and dummy variables. The parameters for these were uh, understood as part of the collect and organize part of the project. Uh, segmenting as per the type of attributes, we already explained that, uh, you know, you could have uh, attributes like math or numeracy, which was, which had a right answer and, you know, psychometric at, at, um, attributes, which do not have any right, one right answer. Uh, creating new average calculation and storing for display. So as new uh, candidates come and take assessments, the calculation should update and validating the new average before storing. So there should not be a bug at any point. Uh, if there is something very widely different, which is coming through, uh, it should raise a uh, red flag to the uh, uh, team. Uh, now, uh, some other details are confidential and I will, I'm not at a liberty to share with you here, but I think uh, it has given you a sense of how we did a pro the project and the fact that, uh, you know, this is what came out of the project, right? Um, uh, I hope you have enjoyed this session and I hope you can use this 25, 50, 25, Act 1, Act 2 and Act 3 principle to create your storyboards uh, for analytics. Uh, again, uh, just to reiterate, uh, define is Act 1, collect organize, visualize, and analyze, which can take anywhere between 50 to 60% of a project time, okay, uh, is act two, okay. And uh, finally, uh, the act three is the insights and a possible deployment, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, framework um, or suggestion uh, that should form the act three. Uh, if you have any, um, uh, you know, uh, doubts etc reach us at score at pexitix and you can definitely look up our assessments at pexitest.com thank you